for the Already versus Nike panel. Uh, professor, my colleague and friend, David Schwartz, is an associate professor of law here at Chicago Kent. And he's also the co-director of the Center for Empirical Studies of Intellectual Property. Professor Schwartz teaches patent law, patent litigation, and intellectual property strategies class. And his research focuses on empirical studies of patent law and judicial behavior. And if you're not aware of it, he has become one of the authorities on analyzing the empirical data on uh, NPEs, non-practicing entities, and patent trolls, the more common term that they're known by. Uh, Professor Schwartz has a BS degree with high distinction in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois, and he graduated cum laude from the University of Michigan Law School. Professor Schwartz, Dave, take it away. Thanks. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel. We have two distinguished panelists, uh, one uh, an academic and the other a practitioner who argued the case in front of the Supreme Court. So on my far left is Professor Mark Janis. And so Professor Janis is the Robert A. Lucas Chair and Director of the Center for IP Research at Indiana University's Maurer School of Law. He's authored numerous treatises and textbooks, including one on IP and antitrust law and another on trademarks and unfair competition. He's also authored numerous law review articles on IP, antitrust, uh, trademark law, and IP protection for designs. Um, Professor Janis has a chemical engineering degree from Purdue and a law degree from the University of Indiana. On my near left is uh, Jim Dabney. And so Jim Dabney is a litigation partner and the head of Freed Frank's IP and technology practice group. He litigates in district courts. He's tried cases before uh, judges and juries. He also um, has tried PTO administrative proceedings as well as handled numerous appeals. He represented um, KSR in the landmark Supreme Court case uh, involving obviousness from a few years ago. And he also represented already before the Supreme Court in this case. He has an undergraduate degree from Harvard, a JD degree from uh, Cornell, and he clerked for Judge James Hill on the Fifth Circuit. And so um, I look forward to hearing our panelists' views on this case. And so what I'm going to do is provide the, a brief summary of the case and then get right into some questions. And so the case started with Nike being the plaintiff. Okay, and so Nike brought a lawsuit and they complained about two styles of shoes that already was making and selling. And they alleged that, and Nike alleged that those shoes infringed and diluted a Nike uh, trademark. And so already uh, denied the claims and it also counterclaimed and sought cancellation of Nike's registration because it claimed that the registration, that the configuration was not a trademark. And so the time, about eight months in, Nike unilaterally executed a covenant not to sue. And so what that covenant not to sue said was that Nike promised that it would not sue already for any of its existing shoe designs or ones that were colorable imitations. And then Nike moved to dismiss both its complaint and already's counterclaim. The lower court held that um, there was no jurisdiction for already's counterclaim, and it dismissed the case, and the Second Circuit affirmed. And so this goes up to the Supreme Court, and they unanimously affirm the decision. Uh, but they say that the lower court had used the law, wrong uh, legal standard and it applied the burdens incorrectly. And so the Supreme Court, in an opinion written by Justice Roberts, says that, said that the, um, the burden was erroneously placed on already, the party that was complaining or asking for cancellation of the mark. Uh, and it, the lower courts had erroneously required them to prove that the case was not moot. And instead, the court says that Nike has the burden. And then it looks and uh, investigates whether Nike satisfied that burden, and it decides that Nike had satisfied the burden, that the case was moot. And it said that no shoe that already uh, could sell would infringe the trademark or dilute the trademark and fall outside the covenant not to sue. 
And the one kind of cute line by the court is uh, where Justice Roberts writes, if such a shoe exists, the parties have not pointed to it, there is no evidence that already is dreamt of it, and we cannot conceive of it. It sits, as far as we can tell, on a shelf between Dorothy's ruby slippers and Perseus's winged sandals. And so on that basis, the court found that the counterclaim uh, was moot and the case was dismissed. And so turning now to questions for the panel, um, the case hinges on subject matter jurisdiction, but I want to talk a little bit about like the underlying merits of the case, which the court doesn't get to. In its covenant not to sue, uh, Nike said that the reason why it was offering a covenant not to sue was that it wanted to avoid the substantial time and expense of continued litigation. And so I, I, I want to ask both panelists, but I want to ask maybe Jim first, you know, do you buy that? Was, was, this, was there a basis, a strong basis, that the underlying uh, counterclaim that the mark should be canceled um, was, was going to succeed? Is, what was, what's the basis that this would be invalid? Well. The dynamic that was at work in the Already versus Nike case was conceptually very similar to the dynamic that you just heard about from Professor Lemley in the immediately preceding sentence. And by that I mean the plaintiff in this case had put at risk uh, what it claimed was a trademark that protected against competition, a very, very large business. They uh, claimed that they sold 100,000 pairs of Air Force One Go sneakers uh, every month. Uh, and they unexpectedly were met with a response to their suit, which asserted not only was there no infringement, but that the emperor has no clothes, and what you have claimed to be a trademark is a shoe, not a trademark. It's a trademark ineligible subject matter, and the registration you procured should be canceled. So uh, at that point, Nike was faced uh, with a rather asymmetrical fight. Sorry, I neglected to turn on my, my microphone. So. Uh, uh, Nike was in litigation with a competitor that was quite small relative to it, uh, whose countersuit threatened to bring down the whole house of cards. And so like the uh, uh, branded pharmaceutical companies uh, that were making payments in the reverse payments context, where they had a large market protected by a potentially vulnerable patent, uh, what Nike did in this case was to attempt to oust the district court, and they eventually succeeded, albeit by a different route than they had planned, to oust the court of jurisdiction to hear the counterclaim by delivering a sweeping and total waiver of its own claims against the defendant. So the question that's put to me, did Nike really do this uh, because uh, it just didn't want to uh, incur the additional expense of finishing off the litigation that started? Not likely. Uh, Nike did this rather obviously, in my view, and I think in the view of most commentators, uh, to try to avoid um, the risk that its uh, registration would be uh, canceled in litigation. So David, you asked two kind of different questions there, um, and, and maybe let me respond to them and, may, and, and, and highlight a couple of points of disagreement here, uh, that, which will be fine. This will be fine. Uh, so thing number one you ask, you know, should we buy what Nike represented? And uh, you know, I'm here speaking, I'm a relative stranger to the record, so in, in some ways I'm going to have to defer. But all I can say is that as a relative outsider to the record, I look at the representations that are made by Nike. I think about your question, and I, I think what you're really asking is, is Nike really making these representations in bad faith? I don't know. Uh, but they look an awful lot like representations that are made uh, by parties all the time uh, that, by and large, we tend to accept uh, in the interest of resolving disputes. So all I can say there is I'm just, I'm not so sure. And if the question really is about Nike's bad faith, 
I, I do kind of wonder whether that puts that at, at a little bit of a higher plane. We really have to scrutinize that more carefully. That, that's part number one. Part number two, uh, the question about the invalidity on the merits, I, I really do think that's a key question here. If you peel away all of the uh, jurisdictional talk that, that suffuses the entire case, and you really ask, um, why should we care so much about Already's validity uh, counterclaim remaining alive? Um, surely the answer to that would be well, because it bears some indicia of probable success, right? It, it looks like this is probably an invalid registration. And I think that really does deserve some close scrutiny. So. Um, Again, I, I, I can't claim to, to know the full record, but are there facts that would suggest a, a problem with priority of use and not that I know of? Are there facts that would suggest a problem with functionality, not that I know of? Uh, are there facts that would dis, uh, suggest a problem of distinctiveness? Well, I, that's always tougher to know, uh, but we've got a registration here, a mark that's, that's been used for since the 80s. Uh, they've had a long time to build up secondary meaning, uh, and it just doesn't look like the same kind of uh, mark where, where you would just instantly say, oh, it's probably not distinctive. What Jim said a minute ago was that it's ineligible subject matter, and boy, that's a tough mountain to climb. Uh, Section 45, the definition of trademarks, is really broad, and there's been no court in years that has said uh, the, that product design trade dress falls outside of that statutory definition. So uh, it, uh, it might, might, uh, but gosh, that seems pretty tough. Now, th there is a different kind of argument that I do think is really plausible. I can't tell whether this was actually made, but it could very, very well be that it was made, and it just doesn't show up to me as an outsider reading these case, uh, this case. I think there's a question about scope. And if you look at Nike's registration that was at issue in the case, uh, the regist it's not for a shoe, it's for a design for parts of a shoe. And if you look at the way it's depicted in the registration, uh, there's all kinds of broken lines there. They talk about it's really a d the design for certain parts of the side panel and other, you know, it, a partial part of the shoe. <clears throat> That's a really broad registration, and it could very well be that the evidence of secondary meaning that Nike can show is a lot narrower, is, is ties to the commercial product, the commercial Air Force ones that they're actually selling, and uh, wouldn't support a registration that broad. That's an interesting argument. It's an argument that prevailed recently in the Louboutin Red Shoes case uh, in which the court ordered the patent office to narrow uh, the scope of the registration uh, to conform to the secondary meaning evidence that the court believed that Louboutin had put on. So that argument strikes me as one that's really worth hearing about, but that, that strikes me as a scope argument rather than a validity argument. Would you like to Yes, respond? well, I, uh, I find myself in disagreement with my esteemed colleague on, on uh, a number of these this points. Is, this makes it fun. Um, uh, first of all, um, the Supreme Court of the United States did not grant certiorari in this case in order to decide uh, whether or not uh, a shoe is trademark eligible subject matter or to uh, consider the merits of uh, the Nike claim. This case was a case about federal court judicial power. Uh, Already versus Nike is the third case in IP that the Supreme Court has granted cert in in 20 years in which the issue is, do we have a capital C case under the meaning of the Constitution? Why does that matter? It matters because the definition of case for purposes of Article III judicial power affects the scope and the extent to which federal judges can overturn the handiwork of the USPTO. And during its lifetime, 
starting in 1982. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has articulated one after another after another doctrine, which has tended to limit the authority of federal courts to determine that subject matter claimed in a patent or subject matter registered under a registration of a trademark is, in fact, not valid patent or trademark subject matter. KSR was a case like that. Cardinal Chemical was a case like that. Metamune was a case like that. And already is a case like that. Already involved a doctrine that originated in the federal circuit, which is you have a suit pending in federal court already. The patent owner, in, in this case the trademark, this, the alleged trademark owner filed suit. And then, in the middle of the stream, got cold feet and turned tail and headed for the hills. And the issue was whether or not it could terminate an existing case by unilaterally waiving all of its claims. The issue was not whether Nike had good faith or bad faith. The issue was, what was the legal effect on the court's constitutional power of the plaintiff waiving all of its claims? What was the effect of the waiver? The position of the defendant in the case was, of course, Nike, you're going to waive your claims because you never had any claims. Your waiver of claims changed nothing insofar as the defendant is concerned. Now let's get to the countersuit. And with, and with all respect to the suggestions that, of course, uh, the Nike uh, Air Force One low configuration could be likened to the red color on the sole of a shoe, uh, there is no Supreme Court case that has ever recognized such a claim, and on various rationales, the Supreme Court has persistently rejected such claims when they have been presented, sometimes on functionality grounds, sometimes on preemption grounds, sometimes on other grounds. So it is very much an open question, and Nike was very, very aware of this when it waived all of its claims. So the way to think about the significance of the already case to me when I was a law student, I had the very great and good fortune to have a torch course with the late Professor Irving Younger, who was a charismatic, wonderful lecturer, practitioner, scholar, academic. And the first time we uh, were introduced to the concept of burden of proof and the importance of the burden of proof, he told me something that I've never forgotten, and now after you've heard this lecture, probably you will never forget. He says, well, if the issue in your case is who came, which came first, the chicken or the egg, whoever has the burden of proof on that issue will lose. And what was actually at stake in the already case is when a plaintiff like Nike waives all of its claims and takes the position that its unilateral voluntary act has ousted the court of jurisdiction, has rendered moot a suit pending against it, the proponent of the claim of mootness bears the burden of proving that its unilateral act, in fact, eliminates all adverse effects that could co constitute injury to the counterclaim plaintiff. The lower courts in the Second Circuit and in the Federal Circuit had, had placed the burden on a party in already's position. The Supreme Court unanimously said that was wrong. It was Nike's burden to prove that. And the way that they affirmed the case was to do something that only the Supreme Court of the United States could do, which is to say the covenant Nike gave, as we interpret it, not as the lower courts interpret it, but as we interpret it, uh, they quote the district court's opinion on page two of his slip opinion. They say, the district court, referring to the district court, read the covenant broadly, concluding that any already's future products that arguably infringe the Nike mark would be colorable imitations of already's current footwear and therefore protected by the covenant. So the way that the court found that Nike had managed to carry the formidable burden of establishing that, 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 there, it, that it could not reasonably be expected that it would ever sue already again for infringement of the purported trademark shown in that registration, was that there was, no, there was no shoe anybody could conceive of that would both arguably infringe and not be protected against a suit for infringement um, by, uh, by, uh, by Nike. So there was, a, there was an interpretation 
which, which interpreted away any, the injury in fact that the parties had thought they had been litigating over up until that time. So uh, that's, my, that's my reaction to Professor. Just one more thing on the mayor's. I know you want to talk sure. about the burdens of some other aspects yeah. of the case. I, I just, I wanted, I wondered, uh, is it your position that the Supreme Court's case in Walmart doesn't stand for the proposition that product design trade dress with secondary meaning is protectable, distinctive? What, what, what's, I, I'm not, I'm just, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> Walmart was a case, the key word there is design. And it's a word like invention. It's a word that has many meanings. The design that was at issue in Walmart was an applique on a shirt, like the red color on the sole of a shoe in La Bouton. It was a design, yes, but it was a very particular kind of design. It was a kind of design that could be taken off and applied to some underlying product. And the Supreme Court has suggested in that case and in other cases, that that kind of design, something that can be constituted trade dress because it can be used to dress and be removed while leaving the underlying good intact, can be protected under federal trademark law or potentially even under state trademark law. But when you have something like a shoe configuration, which cannot be removed, it's the thing itself, the Supreme Court of the United States has not only never recognized a non-statutory trademark uh, uh, right in such a product, but in case after case after case when such claims have come to the Supreme Court, whether it's the shredded wheat biscuit or the stiffle pole lamp or the, the fluorescent lighting fixture of uh, Daybright, a Chicago company, by the way, or the wind-resistant traffic sign, uh, they have persistently rejected, not always on the same rationale, but they have never wavered from the proposition that patent law is a two-way street and we have to be mindful that overextending the law of trademarks to patent eligible subject matter can result in the undermining of the bargain that patent law represents. So yes, when the Supreme Court in Walmart said design can be, this design can be, they didn't say every design always is. Uh, there are certain things that I would suggest uh, are not trademark eligible subject matter, even if they could be literally described as design. I, I think the, the spring design in the traffic's case doesn't fit the definition that you just gave. The Supreme Court could have said, this is not even eligible. We don't even have to reach functionality. But now I think we are, we're, we're straying off into the yes. merits of a trademark discussion. <laughs> David better step in here and ask us about burdens or other aspects of the case before we go on for another three hours. Okay. So uh, here the court dismisses the counterclaim as moot based on the covenant not to sue. How could a defendant in Already's position could, uh, could avoid, how could they have avoided that dismissal? Is there any strategy that can be used? Is there another uh, claim that can be brought? Well, there are many rights of action that a defendant wrongly sued for trademark infringement uh, can assert against uh, a plaintiff. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there never was any uh, option to amend because the court determined that uh, there was no subject matter jurisdiction to, 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 hear, to hear anything. Uh, and given the interpretation of the, uh, of the, uh, the covenant in this particular case, uh, I predict that in the coming years, there will be very, very, very few such covenants that actually are successful uh, in turning off cases like this. Um, uh, but yes, there are, there are any number of uh, potential rights of action that could bring up the issue of validity, just like uh, the first panel in Gunn versus Mitten was bringing up. There are many different rights of action that could bring up the issue of patent validity, such as attorney malpractice. I mean, there's, there, were, there were claims that already could have asserted but what you have to realize is that given what the court held, already is now in the position of being an authorized generic, already no longer has any interest in attacking this registration because it's now on the inside looking out. It's no longer in the position of the unlicensed challenger. Now it has every interest in you know, praising and celebrating the, uh, the, 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 the uh, formerly challenged registration. I didn't hear you doing that earlier, praising and <laughs> celebrating. <huh? laughs> 
hey, I'm wearing my, my law professor hat today, and I say. <laughs> well, there, there's another thing, we, we talked about this a little bit last night uh, at dinner, but the, the uh, administrative challenges at the trademark office, I think that's a really important aspect of this. So uh, could a party in the, in the position of already, before they became the authorized right. generic, <laughs> could, uh, could they initiate a petition for cancellation and proceed that way and I think that's a really interesting question, and, and I, I think it's important to remember that one reason that those administrative challenges were created, and, and I would say were deliberately given uh, liberal standing rules, is, is precisely so that parties who could not get jurisdiction in litigation could opt for an administrative challenge. And, and you raise a really interesting question, so what, what do you think would happen if, uh, in the midst of that cancellation challenge, Nike waived the covenant not to sue? Would the patent office be compelled to say, oh, well, we can't proceed with the cancellation proceeding? I think that's very interesting. I think that that would be uh, a huge mistake in the law if the trademark office were to do that or if the Federal Circuit were to uphold it, because I do think that that kind of outlet for these sorts of challenges is really important. I think that that would impair uh, these post-grant challenges greatly. Uh, and I think there's already law that's consistent with that. The Ritchie versus Simpson case, if that guy Ritchie can have standing to bring an opposition proceeding, virtually anybody can have a standing. The test is, do you have a real interest? Do you have a reasonable belief? Two-pronged test. And the court was there uh, very anxious to say, that you can have a real interest without having any uh, specific commercial interest that's not shared by the general public. In cases where it's comp competitor against competitor, uh, I, I think that you, ought to, that, that you ought to clearly have standing to bring these cancellation challenges. <clears throat> and I don't think a covenant not to sue for infringement should have really very much to do with the, the continuance of the trademark office's uh, jurisdiction. After all, the cancellation proceeding is not about someone's right to use, uh, the petitioner's right to use an allegedly infringing mark. It's about the nature of the registration. So I, I think that the administrative route is, is an important alternative route here to vindicate these kinds of arguments. And would, would your answer change if uh, once it moves out of the pure administrative route and then there becomes an appeal to that, from that to the courts? No, no. I, I think once, that once it's established, I, I, I don't think that, for example, Nike should be able to uh, stop an appeal from uh, a cancellation matter by saying, oh, no, no, we, we, there's no longer any suit for infringement. I, I think at that point the proceeding is about the nature of the registration. So, well, so, we might be in agreement on that. I don't well, know. Um, I, I think we are in agreement on that, but I, I believe that agreement is basically inconsistent with our earlier disagreement because uh, the most remarkable point about the oral argument of the Nike case, uh, if you look at page 52, of the oral argument transcript, this very subject came up. And Justice Kennedy was asking Nike's counsel, well, what if already filed a cancellation petition in the Patent and Trademark Office, and there's no Article III issue there, that's an Article I agency, and they're denied. And now they file the same kind of routine federal district court case that has been filed for many, many, many years. And, and, and no you one know, has ever thought the denial. challenging the denial. And no one has ever thought that the plaintiff in such a case who has been rejected in a cancellation petition has to plead anything more than what he pleaded in order to be able to seek cancellation in the Patent and Trademark Office. And, and in fact, it very often is the case that such a petitioner will have no apprehension of suit at all because the registration may be based on the ownership of a foreign registration or someone who's geographically remote, and there's no possibility of any Article III jurisdiction that arises from a right of action belonging to the registrant. And so, what the Supreme Court wanted to know, because the government was arguing this also, that, oh, don't worry, the Supreme Court throwing already out, they can always come down to Washington and we'll handle it. And so this question came up, well, okay, well, if the Patent Office rejects them, would there be federal court authority to review its action? And the response of the respondent was no. The response of the respondent, contrary to what Professor Janus just uh, suggested, no, I think that was that, I, I was that well, if so, if a federal, if an Article III court can hear a capital C case in which the only issue 
is whether a registration should be canceled because the petitioner believes that it will be damaged by the informational effects of the registration in, uh, in uh, confusing people about the legal status of the subject matter of the registration. If a federal court can hear a case like that, how is that different from what already was alleging over and above the fact that it, until the Supreme Court said that there was no product that could ever make that could ever attract the suit. Prior to that, uh, why was uh, the district court uh, any less empowered to hear Already's counterclaim in this suit than it would have been if Already had gone through the administrative process and wound up in the exact same position it was in? I say this registration is invalid and should be canceled. The TTAB has adhered to its prior position that it's registrable. Now court, decide the issue. Would you say that the jurisdictional analysis should be different in that case than in the already case? Yeah, I do, I do say it should be different. They, they have power to review the, uh, the administrative challenge, and that doesn't mean that they have to have power uh, to review it in the form of a declaratory judgment jurisdiction. In, in, in part, that is a wise policy choice to say, look, we created this administrative challenge uh, for situations where there might not be an ongoing infringement suit, but there might be a reason why a public interest in challenging the validity of a registration, the validity of a patent. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a perfectly coherent route to go. Well, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I can see we could go on. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going on, on that one too, it sounds like. Good. Um, Good. But, but what I wanted to turn to is, uh, is a different issue, which uh, Jim, when he was explaining the case, talked about Nike being really like the 800-pound gorilla. And, and the court does talk about the concern of, you know, trademark bullying, where, like, the concern is that uh, the, the, the bully will assert its trademark against smaller... Uh, rivals, and then always, like, if, the, if it looked like the court was going to get to the merits, it would always just dismiss and use a covenant not to sue, and so therefore it would be bullying its smaller rivals. Um, the court brushed aside this concern and just said this was a policy objection. Should this sort of bullying be relevant? Well, I think what we've seen in uh, Cardinal Chemical, Metamune, already there's always a certain degree of subjective judgment that attends defining whether a case, capital C case, is exists, whether a federal court has authority to rule on a case. Uh, and uh, that also is uh, influenced to some extent by your perceptions of what the, you know, what the policy implications might be of drawing the line here versus drawing the line there. Uh, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, I don't think that part of his analysis uh, was necessarily all that bad. He made the point, ha having, having eliminated, having, having established that uh, already didn't face any prospect of a suit, no matter what shoe that it, that it came out with, except for something that had the swoosh on it, the counterfeit. Um, he said, well, if we were to accept uh, this theory that the mere existence of a patent, or the mere existence of a registration was injurious, to anybody whose freedom of action might be, uh, might be affected by it. Uh, that would open the door to, uh, to larger rivals preying on smaller rivals. And it may, it may be beneficial to the little guy in this case, but we don't think that's a good, uh, we don't think that's a good uh, justification for saying that there is a case in this case. So yes, I think, uh, you know, considering what the implications are for party behavior and litigation is a valid part of the calculus for drawing the line here or there in the capital C case determination, but I, I think that part of the decision was uh, actually not all that badly reasoned. Yeah, and so I, I agree with you completely there. I, it's, uh, you, you could, if you weren't careful, and, I, and this I think Jim said last night, this is not even what we were arguing, if you ended up with a rule that said competitor status gives you standing to bring these challenges, then I've been waiting all morning to say this, then consider, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot. <laughs> and if, thank you. <laughs> and, and already is sitting there with the registration, and you can certainly easily picture Nike already literally just sitting there with the registration doing nothing. 
you can imagine Nike swooping in and saying, now we sue you, and that, that, surely that can't be the rule. You'd have a, a whole different brand of trademark bullying. So I think the court was right to mention that. The other thing that might be odd here, and this argument, I, I suppose this is a little too cute of an argument, but let me try it anyway. You know, my, my question is, how much does trademark, the phenomenon of trademark bullying align with validity challenges? And if you say that among the motivations for trademark bullying uh, is uh, the stance that the trademark law has already taken that maybe engenders this paranoia among trademark owners that I must go out and enforce or I'm going to lose my rights, or at least it engenders the ability to sell to clients this kind of paranoia, then ironically making it easier to challenge validity might actually just enhance the paranoia. You might have more of these types of allegations. So I think that just as a policy matter, I mean, you do have to be a little bit careful uh, how you're treading here. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know whether the court sensed that. I actually think it's, it's more uh, significant that the court just alluded to the problem of trademark bullying uh, rather than ignoring it or slapping it down and taking it to saying we don't take it seriously. I, I thought that actually was kind of a, just a little tiny opening of a door uh, that the court might open wider in, in subsequent cases. Okay, well, so we, we unfortunately don't have that much more time, and I've, uh, as all the other moderators have said, I have a whole bunch of questions, and I really have a whole bunch of questions that we didn't get to. But um, are there any audience questions? for the panel. And so if not, I, I will, I'll ask one more on my list, which is th this, this case is a trademark case. Um, this issue actually comes up rather frequently in patent law, in patent litigation, right? There's a line of cases the Federal Circuit has that started with a case called SuperSAC, where patent owners give covenants not to sue, and the Federal Circuit has you know, frequently upheld the lack of case or controversy and upheld uh, dismissal of the case. What are the implications for patent law from this decision? Uh, well, in my view, uh, the rule that was disapproved in the already case was the super sack rule. Uh, and uh, the already case is being cited in patent litigation uh, as grounds for rejecting claims of mootness uh, in patent cases. I don't think you can overstate the significance of the assignment of the burden of proof and the actual holding in already, which was there was no product that the defendant could ever make that would both infringe and not be protected by the covenant. It's going to be a rare case, in my judgment, that any patent owner is going to want to give a covenant like that that would allow someone to rely on the actual holding as, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, the, the, the super sack rule. I think super sack is, um, well, super sack originated at a time when uh, the Federal Circuit was still applying its now discredited two-step test, constitutional step, that you had to have an apprehension of suit coupled with concrete steps to give your opponent a right of action against you. Uh, and that was abrogated by the Metamune case. So to a certain extent already, was uh, a f lower courts following a, a, a principle of law whose intellectual underpinnings had been cut out by an intervening Supreme Court decision. Uh, so I think the uh, already case uh, very clearly, since it's an Article III jurisdiction case, uh, will apply to the exact same covenant not to sue maneuver when, when executed in patent cases. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, and, it's, it's, and as you know, it's, it's already just happening, right? You already see district court cases citing to this formidable burden and saying and scrutinizing these, co in patent cases, uh, scrutinizing these covenants very closely. Now, I think, by and large, these are probably covenants that were written before right. already was decided but scrutinizing them very closely and saying, ah, here's how you didn't meet the burden. Here's how you didn't meet the burden. And I, so that's a very important implication. The other implication that I, that I find interesting is uh, the, the I, I guess, shall I call it the, the dipping of the toe in the water uh, of public interest litigation and patent litigation, uh, the Myriad case, the organic seed growers case, um, I, those cases are, 
already gives the patentee another tool, I would think, to challenge standing in those cases, and it, and it already has come up kind of in the organic seed growers case where uh, they said, oh, there wasn't actually a covenant not to sue here, but there were statements that were kind of by Monsanto that were kind of analogous and, and applied a similar uh, analysis from Nike versus already and said, well, that's it, this moots the case. Uh, no standing. So I think there may be some implications there. As well. to, to, to give you one concrete illustration, in SuperSAC, the undertaking was only as to the existing products of the defendant in that case. Yeah. And under already, that would clearly no longer yeah. suffice, uh, both because the burden is on the person giving the covenant to establish it and because uh, it, you can clearly conceive of other products that would infringe the patent but not be covered by the covenant, and therefore it would not completely eradicate the the adverse effect of the patent on the on the infringer. Well, likewise, in one of these district court cases, the representation in the covenant was, uh, if we're right about the what we think about the accused device, then we're not suing you on it. And the court said, well, that, that's conditional, right? That doesn't meet the requirement that the covenant be unconditional. Yeah. So I, I assume people will learn how to draft these covenants into the rules <coughs> that appear to be emanating from the already case and whether they'll succeed I think will be a really interesting thing to see. Okay, well we're out of time, but join me in thanking our panelists.